Beast by Jake the Snake Big Cake. Book Two. Act Two. Prologue. The consumption was a fascinating thing to study. It had the perfect mix of mystery, beauty, and pure terrifying potential to make it the ideal candidate for testing. Certainly, this would only be acknowledged after Level 99 security protocols had been established, set into place, and then reinforced with a set of Level 14 anti-material containment arrays. Just to get into the facility took a full five rotations, and that was ignoring the paperwork that took two cycles. The shifts themselves were much longer. It was expected that researchers live in-house and remain completely isolated from the outside in all ways. A dead zone, with no interference, just stable and reliable research. This was a place outside of politics, of games, outside of everything but the universe and its mysteries. This was a place where the most intelligent and motivated hammered away at the enigmas of the ages. There were many of those, thousands even, all being worked on in an efficient manner, with the most advanced technology the Union possessed. It was said that in this installation, over 200,000 cycles before, a team of minds had managed to bring life to the inorganic. The discovery that led to the SAI and the nanotech relied upon by almost all of the Union's citizens. This was a place where the impossible was paved over through progress. Outside of the consumption, there were many other projects held in study, from microorganisms to larger biota to the research and construction of new nanobots. Based on your perspective, Wichita containment was likely the most interesting place you could imagine, or the most horrifying thing someone could come up with. As he gazed at the gray crystal, swirling with colors and internal motion, seemingly polished to a perfect sphere, Vinzal found himself firmly believing in the first option. On his free shifts, Vinzal often enjoyed staring at the orb that floated sixty feet behind non-reactive glass, a dense layer of oxygen and nitrogen, and a rapid frequency of sound waves which acted to suspend one tiny, glimmering particle of consumption the most dangerous thing the universe had ever seen. But to him that danger held beauty. It held magnificence. They still didn't understand how it worked. They understood what it did well enough, no mistakes there any longer. This containment was remodeled after a live observation of the fact had cost the lives of thirty researchers and half of their defensive array. Tiny fusion bursts combined with a strange reaction that almost seemed to mimic a rapid pulsing of warp jumping. That, ironically, was also something they didn't quite understand. Hyperspace was a difficult concept to study, considering it didn't exist. A real headache, that one. Three hundred thousand years and no progress beyond being able to aim and shoot. Addendum aim, shoot, and catch the poor souls you fired out of existence as they came back in. The consumption didn't seem to mind going out of existence, and could essentially teleport in tiny sprints during the active stages of the initial and secondary events, breaking the known light-speed predictions. This was what first led Vinzel to his hypothesis and his multi-cycle studies on something so absolutely terrifying and completely unpredictable. Thankfully, between it and him was the 50-foot spherical containment of high-density, non-reactive glass. If given the chance to reach the material, the consumption would still eat through it and multiply. That was what it did to practically any solid. But it didn't do so quite as quickly with the glass. This was recorded as being consumed at an average of 0.53 meters a second in a sample size of 85 installations, only seven of which remain operational. It was proven, though, and it provided the crucial safety net to supply ample time required for the activation of a flash nova and the mercury firing protocols. The consumption wasn't a big fan of heat, not beyond 5,600 degrees Celsius, 
whatever it was. Vinzel checked through the hollow notes on his tablet as he flicked through the last logs. For some reason, they could never get a read on the material. Some of the other researchers had even begun to lovingly refer to the stuff as gray goo. Vinzel thought differently. It was more than that. Beyond all of its other qualities, the consumption had arrived from outside of the Milky Way, outside of their galaxy entirely. Considering it was the only thing known in existence that resembled life to have done so, had drawn him to it. He needed to know where it came from, what conditions led to its formation. Most importantly, though, was the question that ate at him day and night as he established different experiments. How did it communicate? The other researchers laughed at this, called it irrational, but Vinzel knew he was on to something. It was his gut feeling, and he would find a means to prove it true. Or false, if it were to be the case, as any good scientific mind. Still, he believed it was more than just a hypothesis. The consumption was alive, and it was capable of communication. There were too many unexplained factors if this wasn't the case, too many things that wouldn't have been possible. If it wasn't, how else did the scattered pieces react in such dangerous and unpredictable patterns? How did it know to hold dormant and lie in wait for an unsuspecting vessel or a planetary-sized time bomb? How did it know how to stop short of killing an infected host of organic life and to wait for the ideal moment to consume in a wildfire of activity? It was too smart to simply be a dangerous material. It acted with intelligence, but not in the way an observer would notice without an overarching trend to back it. It didn't think like a living thing as an intelligent mind could perceive it, but it did think. It had a system, a program, a thought process of some kind, however deceivingly complicated. It was not random. Vinzel had 200,000 cycles of recorded trends to analyze, study, reanalyze, and decipher. He had reached his conclusion based on this, and now he set out to find proof, some form of substantial and recorded proof that it was more than just a lump of dumb but dangerous gray goo. He no longer treated it as a specimen for study. This was an ancient and intelligent adversary that was more dangerous than death. This was a being with the patience to float for an eternity and spring to life the instant the chance arose. This was a life form that existed purely to make the universe crumble into dust, entropy incarnated. It was a beautiful and sickening sight. As Vinzel set down his holopad and left the observation chamber, he considered what experiments he could try next. The usual shipments of supplies were half a cycle late, but he didn't mind. He had never needed to eat much, just stay hydrated and consume the nutrition recycled by his suit's processor. It was a shame that the shifts on this installation were for ten cycles, though. No, his fellow researchers had not been happy. The defensive protocols were sound, though, completely tamper-proof. None could enter, and none could leave. Vinzel laid his synthetic body down on his bunk as he deactivated the scent and odor detection nerves, withdrawing them back into his form. He had been so absorbed in his work recently that he had barely realized how quiet it had gotten over the last few rotations. How long had it been since he had spoken with the others? The others... Vinzel took his mind off of such trivial matters and refocused his thoughts on the next tests he would complete. Perhaps a hyperspace communication line could be used to influence the subject. In the dark of the Wichita Research Facility, Vinzel slept in a quiet peace, surrounded by the dead. Chapter 1 Safety didn't exist anymore. It might not have ever been there in truth, but now even the illusion was gone, and in its place was the reality that had frantically whispered in the background. The quiet voices sounded like shouts when the room had been emptied, but they had been ignored for too long. The damage was done. There was barely anyone left to hear them anyways. 
the truth of the matter was settling back to what it had once been for all species that had obtained true intelligence when creatures still fought for their meals and fled from becoming one themselves instead of the mud air or water they fled and fought in the gap between the worlds the vast empty spaces where your only chance was to run faster than your enemies and quicker than your prey if you thought you were safe there was a misunderstanding of the situation another illusion and nothing more the danger could come from above below to either side in front or to one's back stronger than you smarter than you and far more dangerous than you could ever hope to be the threat narrowed options down to a single choice run or die cat and mouse you couldn't trust anyone that much was obvious after half the senate calmly drew weapons and began executing the others with no warning all while their armies and fleets did likewise it was like a coup but there was no clear winner or even motivation all species were slaughtered equally and none spared it didn't seem to matter if it was a circumstance of lifelong friendship alliances respect all were thrown to the ground and covered in blood for every assumed agreement there was treachery what had begun as an attempted genocide of the fringe species directed by the gastruca quickly devolved into a slaughter of everything the horrible motivation they had led that they the gastruca themselves had started fell away it was simply a mask a disgusting ruse beneath its disguise of murder rape and mutilation was simply anarchy the gastruca burned with the rest there were no winners some rare few species resisted banded together and fought of the fringe worlds comically the first threatened most survived as the true chaos set in those that had ample time to react to the first assaults fled by the millions banding together under the protection offered by the lines even in the fiercest of the fighting and most horrid of the crimes the lines were the one true exception though they could not leave their posts all who reached them were granted safety still it could be found as tragic irony that the true defenders of life in the galaxy could do nothing but watch as all they protected burned even more tragic still that all of this had begun and in a way been caused by their failure if the personal fleets of the inner systems had not been forced to leave their posts and had instead remained to maintain a constant pressure on their neighbors perhaps things could have been different or perhaps it had been inevitable no one could truly know within a single cycle the armies over almost every species were in ruins their worlds pillaged their young stolen and their resistance crushed the terrible game of survival was all that was left as the losing sides struggled to comprehend how it had happened in the first place the familiar screams over communication channels filled every unit of the galaxy as they begged for mercy it was well known that sika death squads were rare to give it and rarer still were their masters a millennia of evolution had set them into the sky and only a few generations had thought them tamed the union had misunderstood how wrong that belief was you could not take something that walked hand in hand with death rape and murder force it to submit and then believe it yours the arrogance of the union the mentality that it was immortal well now it was united in a different form it had only taken a minuscule fraction to undo all that it had made in the interest of one selfish need a primal necessity that was not all that different from the threat they had fought for so long on their borders to consume everything and everyone the gemeind had finally taken their freedom the prison planets were one of the few legacies left behind by the founders it had been their means of keeping the peace during a time of true strife most records of such time were locked away deep in union freeze cells floating in sealed prisms of hard-coded information crystals which had been synthetically grown and were held at absolute zero 
of the information gleaned from them as traditions held and specified every fifty thousand cycles. The most notable records were of the exiled planets. Even the most proud, advanced, and intelligent races acknowledge that without their technology, stripped naked and abandoned in an unfamiliar environment, they have lost everything. Thus was the original purpose of the exiled worlds. Selected truly at random, these worlds were molded and designed to act as punishment for the most terrible of enemies, for crimes of war, for an enforcement of justice. Morals slipped as politics crept forward, and eventually they were simply a means of leaving behind those who were a threat. During the times closer to the present age, they were simply an efficient method of execution. Any standards of upkeep to the biomes beyond atmospheric composition were abandoned, and often failed experiments were dumped from low orbit. Biohazards, plagues, irregular mechanized units, political dissenters, prisoners of war. The deadlands became something else. Layers of unnatural garbage stacked upon the ancient surface as surely as the poorly maintained terraforming units faltered. The few controlled zones became empty and the planets themselves slipped back into equilibrium. Array Class Monitoring System, Coverage Zone 4, Group 3 Surviving Members, Multiple Casualties Convicted 578043 through 578060 Two Unknown, Unknown Units Class 12 Prison World, Attica Sentence, Death 20 Rotation Commitment Rotation 12 They were late again. Their mad dash out of the ruins came just as the shadows began to creep, stretching forward with strange, contorted shapes. They were like hands, grasping at anything they could, clinging to all that they touched. As the light was blocked, the cold began to replace any trace of warmth in the soil and the strange fungus that inhabited it began to burst and bud, forming into ever-growing tendrils of vines and pods. What came out from within those dark, stretching figures was much worse than the cold. The only place that was safe was the desert, and it had its own dangers. Dunes of sand stretched on for miles on the planet's surface before the vehicle, as it bucked under the strain of a rocky landing, kicking up dirt, sand, and gravel under its wheels. Six of them spun in a synchronized torrent of propulsion, throwing the frame forward through the terrain ahead. The light of a red star slipped along the horizon, presenting a mirage of a bloody pupil with a small black moon for its center. The illusion it presented was a fitting one. Stretching on along the distance was an unnatural formation which seemed to grow in size as they crested over the gradual slopes of elevation, averaging beneath them in the form of rough pitfalls and exposed boulders. The ruins of past civilization stared at them from the horizon. Passing over the highest point to return to a downhill, the wheels occasionally lost traction, providing a sensation of freefall. Several passengers gripped a pale blue metal frame with white knuckles, claws, and tails as they held themselves from going airborne as the forces shifted beneath them. Air began to whip past in gusts, then waves, then in a storm of particles as the weather patterns began to fall in with the approaching darkness. Dusk was not a calm time on the surface. This wasn't the plan, Yatal. Scarred arms held to the steer staff of the vehicle's console, muscles tense under a thin layer of light blue fur, while solid blue eyes stared ahead into the oncoming storm. The voice that sang from her throat was calm, as her tail flicked off the floor to pull a manual release alongside the midsection of the cabin's front end, its scarred tissue wrapping around the lever and yanking it with adept precision. I know, human. Warnings flashed across the hollow screen projections that coated the perimeter of the front windshield, a half dome that streamlined the craft as it cut through the fierce resistance. But you can't hope to protect us from everything. The vehicle's shield unit flashed up as the grains turned to coarse stones, which in turn shifted to projectiles. Their ricochets shooting off into the faltering visibility grew as the craft plowed onward. The storm was upon them now, and with it was a wrath that only nature could bring about. 
As the visibility dropped to zero, the wheeled desert strider came to a forced stop, and Yatel brought all power to the environment shields. They would have to wait it out and hope for the best. Turning in her seat, Yatel pushed away from the controls and faced the others who sat in uncomfortable silence behind them. Their faces gave away no expression, even with the residual knowledge of her biosync translator. It seemed they were wary to give any indication of emotion to someone they did not fully trust or her strange guardian. She gave them all a smile, as the human called it, and watched as the passengers seemed to cringe, a desirable effect, especially considering how badly she needed cooperation. Yatal still found it difficult to believe how many things had gone wrong to land them here in the first place. Keeping this many alive was nothing short of a miracle, and by all rights they should have died their first day. There were thirteen of those down now, and they still had seven to go. Yatal leaned back and closed her eyes, letting her body tune into a light slumber. Her mind fell backwards, and the familiar feeling of reflection took over in the rhythm of her slowly cycling heartbeats. A slow pulse, a tiny drum that set forth their many songs. Not all species had hearts, but Yatal firmly believed that those that did shared a kinship of sorts. It was a constant reminder of how fragile their lives were, constantly striking out against the echoes of the void. A tiny voice of resistance that kept them alive. From here, in her sleeping trance, Yatal could make out the crashing base of the human's heart. Some voices of resistance were stronger than others. Passing into deep layers of the trance, the surroundings began to fade away, and Yatal's waking mind began to fade into a general focus. The subconscious period of reflection began to shift over in tiny drops, like stones skipping across the surface of her thoughts. She needed to plan ahead, but that wasn't where the focus landed as it sunk into her mind, down beneath the surface. Instead, she drifted, and thoughts of the past became her reality. The emergency crash near the 33rd had been what started the snowball effect, and Yatel hadn't even been conscious for most of it. When she finally came back to lucidity, all hell had apparently broken loose, but in a quiet way, a deceitful trickery that lulled her into an absurd state of mind that, for once, everything was working out. When the military finally responded to the distress signals and sent a rescue squad down from orbit to the planet surface, things had seemed almost normal. Legalities of crashing into a military base aside, it appeared that by doing so lives had been saved, even if this had simply been a fluke. It also helped that they had a full cargo bay of military gear, which had arrived on schedule despite all the chaos going on above. Yatal had managed to stagger to her feet and, doing her best to ignore the gaping hole in her ship's ceiling in the passageway outside of the bridge, which appeared to have no obvious relation to their crash landing, walked with her human escort to greet the Union rescue vessel's lieutenant. Formal greetings, recognition for valor in the face of danger. The individuals that had unintentionally been rescued by the crash landing were all put into stasis pods before Yatal had even thought to take a look at them. Apparently they were in rough shape, and it made sense to her if the body parts that were scattered all over the ground among the debris were any indication. She had been glad to learn her ship hadn't run over any intelligent life, and thankful that her record would avoid unintentional manslaughter charges. Avoiding entire systems due to warrants for arrest would have been extremely stressful. The second ship that came down seemed to pull the curtains away, Concern was present with the lieutenant, and even more so with his crew behind him as the vessel touched down in an aggressive manner, landing dangerously close to the gathering in the open courtyard. The soldiers behind their commanding officer quickly began communicating through their combat suit comm systems for information, as their lieutenant in turn raised a scaled limb to indicate that everyone remain calm. When armed squads came out of the second ship, weapons drawn, confusion turned to tension, and when they opened fire, the raised limb wasn't enough to prevent the favor from being returned. The following shootout introduced Yatal and her ship beast to the Civil War. The popping of shields cracked in screeching bursts of energy sizzling through the air, synchronizing with the pulsing fire of weaponry in all directions— 
As a shock grenade burst at their feet, Yatal was thrown from a lucidly surreal state of confusion to hard-earned, half-conscious struggle to keep her thoughts in a straight fashion. Soldiers began to die in a tremendous affair as plasma bolts boiled and burst their flesh apart, while those lucky enough to have had time to react brought retribution back upon their aggressors, letting loose with volleys of organized fire. A huge variety of weapons were unslung and unloaded, and bursts of pressure differences began to throw any being present from their feet. In the pandemonium, Yatal found herself dragged by the scruff of her mane like a young spawnling and tossed behind cover by the ridiculous force of her guardian, shortly followed by the human himself rolling in directly behind her with a rough grunt. Cover which then lurched to throw them yet again as it took off from the planet's surface on the screaming signals issued by the lieutenant an instant before his head was torn off by what appeared to be a metal death machine. Gore flew through the air in slow motion as the monstrosity turned to face them with a flat face of cold black sensors and jagged grafted shards. The scene fell away beneath them as the ramp lifted to seal in those that had made it inside. Yatal had just enough of a view to watch the robotic third party turn and lunge for the original assailants before she was slumped over from the sheer force of their accelerated ascension skyward. Heavy metal clicked shut, and a shield fusing appeared along the seams, suggesting they were heading for a trip out of the current atmosphere. As the events caught up to them, it was suddenly apparent that Yatal abruptly found herself alone with the human, and a large number of individuals she was not familiar with in a military ship, which had just lost a commanding officer from friendly fire and was now heading towards a combat zone for refuge. "'What the frack just happened?' a loud voice rang out from the far side of the hangar. "'I'm not sure. Friendly fire, aggressive third party seemed to be cleaning them up, just received word from the bridge. The lieutenant is down.' The response was a much meeker presence, faintly coming from the back left corner. My broodmate is out there. Turn this void-burnt ship back towards that battle. We can still save them. If the lieutenant is down, I'm in charge of this operation. Sir, death orders not to be overruled. Procedure and code are to be followed. Fracking damn it all to the void. This is your fault. The accusatory voice directed towards her now. Yatal was slipping slowly down against the wall. She hurt too badly. Her sides seemed to burn, her head seemed to crunch in on her mind as though her skull was under extreme pressure. It wasn't a good time to be defenseless, but her own capacity was entirely irrelevant. Her ship beast, with its gleaming collar, stepped in front of her immediately, drawing a sword with a single, fluid motion from its waist. The weapon was easily three units long, and it held an off-kilter color, a strange bluish tinge that held even in the dim light of the hold. They would still be alive if we hadn't come down to this forsaken rock! The voice seemed to tremble with rage as it spoke in a low, fierce tone. That mechanized unit was forbidden military tech. Only the lines are allowed to use those things. Well, how the frack did it end up on the planet, then? Those things are usually only in deep space. I don't know. It happened too quickly. I didn't even recognize what it was at first. Heavy customization. SA units don't usually even have a weapon function, but that one had blades welded all over the place. Where did it even come from? The voices grew silent for a moment, and Yatal felt her mane began to prickle as it rose along her scalp and down her spine. The simplest explanation was generally the most likely, and in this case, the simplest explanation was not a good one. Stand up and put your limbs where we can see them. The voice was supported by the shuffling of boots and claws scraping the metal dockwork as soldiers began to fan out. Lights flashed on in a bright shock as the ceiling glowed to full volume revealing the bay beneath it. The feeling in her gut was equivalent to the song of discomfort murmuring from her throat as she tried to stand up, pushing her hands against the metal framework to push into position. All around her were angry soldiers, and in their hands or claws were weapons, laser sights glowing trajectory paths of beam weapons that would reach her before she could blink, flee, or beg. The only thing between them and her was the human. The ship beast, by contract, that she wasn't even sure trustworthy, 
Call the creature off, shipmaster. We don't want to hurt it, but we're going to take you into custody until this gets sorted out. The massive sword slowly dragged its tip along the heavy tiles before it, leaving a thin gash along the dockwork floor before the human raised it up into a defensive stance and backed away from the aggressors. Yatal's slender frame was completely hidden behind the muscular form as her guardian nudged her back into the corner of the bay and out of the targeting sites. Murmurs of confusion slipped out as hushed voices communicated over the comm systems, and flashes of data searches ran on their HUD screens. Thing has a collar, but I've never seen one before. Anyone know what that thing is? It has a mech blade. Skins aren't showing much of anything useful. Just use caution. It probably just doesn't know any better. She probably has the thing life-bonded. The volume increased as the leader shouted, Last chance, shipmaster! We will not hesitate to put that thing down! Yatal leaned against the cold, smooth plating of the wall, slumping against the second with her shoulder as her scarred tail curled around her. Exhaustion was present, seeping everywhere in her mind. Everywhere but a tiny spark of something else. A feeling of invisible presence in the front and center of her brain. As much as he had remained distant, it seemed she hadn't completely failed to get through to him after all. Slowly, she leaned herself toward that in a concentrated effort to grab onto it as if it were a physical thing, something that was palpable. If she could touch it, she might be able to manipulate. The volley of thoughts that hit her were something of insanity itself, an insane stream of ridiculous assessments, of dark and covered motivations, of desperate emotions, of pure, caged anger, terror, and guilt. I'm the legacy. I'm the last. Images of a burning planet, of cruisers in the dark. I have to make it back to her. The images pummeled Yatel in a volley. Her intentions fell aside and dissipated like wisps of smoke as she simply felt it pull her in, accelerating her toward its center like a black hole before spitting her out in stunning force that rattled her into a stunned slump against the human's back. All that from what barely classified as a link a peephole's equivalent, a sliver of comparison to a life bond. As soon as she touched it, she knew that it had done the same. A foreign flush of currents soaked her mind, riptides and flurries. She wasn't ready for it. It saw everything, all of who she was, in an instant, an impression of a snapshot of a memory. Then, as quickly as it had appeared, it was simply gone, back to the tiny spark in the front of her mind, but slightly larger than before. A tiny spark that was no longer a flush of ever-changing insanity, alien or terrifying, overwhelming scattering of thoughts. So transfixed by it, Yatal almost missed the whisper that rustled through her mind. You should probably warn them.